A very good morning to all and welcome to N Park Spotlight. A special thank you for joining us today, right after polling day. And of course, for those that have attended our talks before, we're glad to have you back. My name is Leslie and I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. The N Park Spotlight series aims to introduce and promote a deeper understanding of our local biodiversity. We are online every Saturday morning from 10.30 to 11.30 and you can join us on Zoom or stream the sessions live on our YouTube channel. Last week, we talked about rainforests. Today, we will continue focusing on habitats by looking at coastal and marine habitats on different islands around Singapore. This is our program. After a quick introduction, we will dive right into today's presentation, Sunny Islands Set in the Sea. Our speaker is manager for the coastal and marine branch of NBC, Jonathan Tan. If you have any questions during the presentation, do send them to me, Leslie, as a private message using the Zoom chat. And we'll try to address a few of them during the Q&A later on. So let's get going. I will now hand the time to Coastal and Marine Branch Manager of the National Biodiversity Center, Jonathan Tan. Over to you, Jonathan. Hi, Leslie. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, just let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay, uh, morning everyone. Uh, so for today's talk, uh, I'm hoping to bring you guys on the journey through uh, all the different coastal and marine habitats we have in Singapore. Uh, but before we start off, um, just a quick uh, warm up quiz uh, to see how much you guys already know about our coastal and marine environment. So if you use your phones or your computer, you can go to this website and key in this code uh, and it will come up um, with a number of quiz questions that we will be looking at. Okay, we'll just wait about another 30 more seconds to see if anyone else wants to join. Okay, uh, I think uh, we'll start about now. I... Okay, so um, the first question we have uh, is, what is the name of the island that is mainland Singapore? Okay, so is it Pulau Sakijang, Pulau Tembaku, Pulau Jong or Pulau Ujong? Oh, okay. Quite a number of people actually did manage to get the correct answer. So Pulau Ujong uh, is an old Malay name for Singapore's island and it actually means uh, the island at the tip of the peninsula uh, because we are right at the southernmost point of the Malay Peninsula. Okay, moving on. Uh, next question. Okay, this is the leaderboard. And the next question we have is... Oh, sorry. Okay, which of the following is not a habitat found in Singapore? Is it kelp forest, seagrass meadow, coral reef, or coastal forest? Oh, okay. So quite a number of you guys are quite knowledgeable. I, 
uh, about marine habitats? And you have the correct answer. Kelp forest is not found in Singapore. Uh, it's actually found mainly in uh, temperate countries like the USA or Australia. But we do have examples of all the other three habitats mentioned there within our own waters. Okay, now for our next question. Which of the following animals is not found in Singapore? Is it dolphins, dugongs, sea snakes, sea turtles, sharks, or actually all of them are found in our waters? Oh, great. Looks like uh, quite a number of us are actually very knowledgeable about our marine life. And yes, you can in fact find all these animals within uh, our very own waters. Uh, some of them need a bit more luck, uh, but with uh, visiting our shores enough, hopefully you will get a chance to see them. It looks like Thomas the tank engine is uh, speeding ahead out of everyone. Okay, how many species of hard coral have been recorded for Singapore? Is it 144, 169, 196, or 255? Oh, sorry, I'm not sure why the timer for this question is so long, but uh, just give it two more seconds and... Oh, wait, sorry, I'm not sure if it worked properly. Oh, okay, yeah, so uh, the correct answer is 255. Uh, and in fact, um, there could actually be more species of hard coral in Singapore than this number. It's just that uh, they've yet to be discovered, yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, where can mainland Singapore's last natural coral reef be found? Uh, is it at East Coast Park, West Coast Park, Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve, Labrador Nature Reserve, Changi Beach Park, or Coney Island? And the answer is, in fact, Labrador Nature Reserve. So Labrador Nature Reserve uh, has the last remaining uh, rocky cliff uh, and natural rocky shore on our mainland. If you visit uh, the jetty area there, you can actually see the very last coral reef that remains on mainland Singapore. OK, so now uh, moving on to uh, a question uh, from you guys, more for you guys rather. So what's your favorite uh, coastal place to visit in Singapore? Changi and West Coast Park. Changi, Labrador. Oh, I see some of the southern islands coming up now, like Sisters Island and St. John's. Oh, it seems like Labrador is actually very popular. Oh, Changi as well. Uh, hopefully for the beach and not just for the food at Changi Village. Uh, I see Pulau Ubin, Honey Island. East Coast Park a bit here and there. Okay, so uh, the great thing is that for today's talk, we're actually going to cover habitats that can be found in all of these areas. So hopefully after today, uh, you'll have a better of idea of uh, what kind of habitats you are looking at when you visit your favorite coastal areas. And maybe some ideas for where you can visit next time. Okay, so now to go back to uh, today's talk. Okay. So uh, a bit of background about uh, Singapore's coastal marine environment. Uh, as everyone knows, 
uh, we have a very busy uh, marine environment, right? We have the world's uh, second busiest container port. Uh, we have uh, oil refineries on Jurong Island. We have uh, shipyards, both in the north and south. We have fish farms in the north and south as well. And we've also done a lot of coastline modification over the years. Uh, but despite all this, um, we still have a rich variety of coastal marine habitats, not just in terms of uh, species alone, but even the types of habitats that we have. And what makes Singapore really special compared to uh, everywhere else in the world is that these coastal marine habitats are right next to uh, some of our industrial areas. So if you look at Pulau Sumatau here, it's our only landfill, but it's also home to a rich coral reef, seagrass meadow, and mangrove forest. Uh, Pulau Hantu is Singapore's most popular scuba diving spot, and it's right next to uh, oil refineries on Pulau Bukong. Sirene Reef, uh, you can see here, is a submerged patch reef that's surrounded by uh, the Industrial Triangle of Jurong Island, Pasir Panjang Container Port, and Pulau Bukong. Yet, it continues to hold uh, one of our richest and largest seagrass meadows. And we are finding so many species in Singapore uh, that uh, most of these you probably ne never heard of. We have uh, more than 250 species of hard coral, uh, 36 species of mangrove, and 12 species of seagrass. And if you look at the percentage uh, of the global species count, you can see it's quite respectable, given how tiny we are. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, hundreds of fish species, uh, 200 sponges, uh, 50 sea and anemone species, and more than 30 different species of sea star. And we are always finding new things as well. So in the past 10 years, uh, scientists uh, working in collaboration with MPARCs have discovered more than 100 species that were not previously known from Singapore, and 30 species completely new to science, meaning that no one else in the world had described them up to that point. So what explains uh, our rich marine biodiversity? For one, it's the fact that we are located uh, just outside the Coral Triangle. So if you look at these maps, you see that the Coral Triangle uh, in Southeast Asia is the heart of diversity for corals, mangroves, and seagrass, which are basically the most diverse kinds of uh, marine ecosystems. And because we're located uh, just outside it, uh, we have a lot of spillover of rich marine life into our waters. Uh, on, on top of that, we are the conflux of three regional seas. So you know that um, traditionally we speak about Singaporeans coming from uh, China, India, and uh, the Malay archipelago. It's actually quite similar for the marine life that we have. So for example, this sea star, Hedas Arrestor memoriatus, uh, is found only in the Indian Ocean, and Singapore is the easternmost known uh, location that it can be found. Uh, this species of hard coral uh, is found only in the South China Sea, and we are the southernmost uh, locality. And we also have uh, animals that are uh, found as far away as Australia, such as the clown and the mini fish, uh, but yet also in Singapore. On top of that, we have lots of islands, right? So the more islands you have, the more coastline you have, the more marine habitat you have. Uh, and this question of how many islands we actually have is actually a very tricky one to answer. So uh, traditionally, in a lot of um, uh, official materials, it's said that Singapore has 63 offline, uh, offshore islands. Um, but actually, depending on how you count them, the number can vary. If you decide to lump every single island that's uh, been joined up into one island, we will actually have 41 islands today. And before Raffles came, we actually had 75. So what explains this uh, disparity in number? Uh, partly it's the fact that lots of islands have been joined up into bigger islands. Uh, for example, Jurong Island is the most famous example. Uh, at the same time, we've also created new islands uh, through uh, reclamation. And there are also islands which uh, used to exist but no longer exist as islands. Today, they're just coral reefs. For example, Sirene Reef that I pointed out earlier uh, was known as Pulau Pandan before Raffles arrived. So our islands and our marine habitats are constantly dynamic, constantly changing. Uh, Another interesting thing about Singapore is that even though we are so small, we actually have a lot of heterogeneity in our habitats. Uh, Singapore is not the same everywhere. Our north is actually very different from our south. <clears throat> so in the north, we have a lot more freshwater input coming from Malaysia <clears throat> via the Johor River, which means that uh, habitats like mangrove forest uh, in red here are much more common in the north. Uh, whereas in the south, 
where the salinity is much higher, uh, it's dominated by coral reef. And interestingly, you can actually see how uh, from this uh, paper published this year, uh, our shores in the north and south actually are quite distinct in terms of the communities that we have. Uh, you can see that the southern shores, which are much more coral dominated, are uh, all clustered together. And we have a whole spectrum of uh, habitats as we move from land down into the sea. Uh, so here you can see how um, in an idealized diagram of how uh, as you go from land into deeper waters, the kind of habitats you get will shift. And each one of these habitats is unique. Uh, it has distinct characteristics and therefore different kinds of species. In some places like Czech Jawa, today you can still see the full spectrum of uh, different habitats side by side. But also keep in mind that animals don't really respect these boundaries that we draw between habitats and they can move between them. So this is Czech Jawa uh, and you can see through this photo just how uh, like so many different habitats can fit into one tiny space. You have mangrove forest here, <coughs> seagrass meadow further out, coastal forest, sandbar or sand flat, the open sea and mud flat. So what we're going to do today is uh, we'll gradually take a journey from uh, land uh, and move out towards the open sea. And as the waters uh, cover more and more of, uh, of the area, we'll see uh, different kinds of animals and plants. So we'll start off with coastal forest. <clears throat> so coastal forest is very different from tropical rainforest, which you might have heard of in last week's talk. Uh, this is a habitat uh, which you can find in these areas. And its soil is very nutrient poor. Uh, conditions are very harsh because there's no shelter from heavy winds and heavy storms. Uh, yet coastal forests can be split into two different types as well. So the first type is uh, coastal uh, rocky cliff uh, coastal forests, which you can see here uh, at Sentosa and uh, Pulau Tekuko. Uh, these are a habitat where um, plants must literally cling onto the rock face and they are, tend to be slow growing because they need to be very tough in order to survive these harsh conditions. On the other hand, it's a different kind of coastal forest, uh, which we are much more familiar with, that grows on sandy soil. So for example, your casuarina trees, uh, your coconut trees, and your sea almond, these can be found in uh, much flatter areas uh, like Pulau Ubin or uh, Coney Island. So coastal forest is actually home to many rare plants, uh, such as the Raffles pitcher plant, uh, which you can see over here, uh, and the flower is coming out. So the pitcher plant, uh, because it's able to catch uh, insects for additional nutrients, it does very well uh, on this uh, nutrient poor soil. We also have plants with important human uses like this fish poison tree, which is traditionally used as a source of uh, poison by fishermen to stun fish. Uh, and it's also an important habitat for many birds to nest like the great built heron, which is Singapore's tallest bird, or the Brahmini kite, uh, which is a raptor that hunts fish. Uh, amongst this, we also have rare plants like the mantigi. So this plant uh, or tree uh, is very slow growing and it's only ever found growing on rocks uh, in very exposed areas. And you can see how it causes the trunk of the tree to be uh, in a very uh, twisted and gnarled shape. And in fact, we even have uh, native conifer trees. So this is a pine tree called uh, sea teak or podocarpus that is found growing uh, only in our coastal areas. Although nowadays it's been planted uh, in a lot of coastal parts by NPARPs. So now moving into uh, towards the sea proper, uh, we have uh, mangrove forest. So mangrove forest, as I mentioned earlier, is found mostly in the north of Singapore, although there are smaller patches in our southern islands. So mangrove forest uh, uh, is made up of trees that is adapted to flooding by saltwater at high tide. Right. So twice a day when the tide is high, uh, their roots are completely covered by the seawater. But at the same time, they need to be located at river mouths or at least in areas with some freshwater input uh, because they can't tolerate very high salinity. Mangrove forests are actually very rich and they hold uh, lots of species of birds, mammals, reptiles and invertebrates. And they are an important nursery for fish. So some examples of uh, mangrove plants that we see here. Uh, you can see how they can uh, take on different forms. Uh, this tree here has uh, pencil roots to help it breathe through the mud. Uh, this one has uh, prop roots, which enable the tree to stand up above the high tide mark. 
so that it can continue breathing uh, and stand strong against waves. And many birds uh, like these uh, egrets take advantage of uh, the trees to take shelter during high tide. Uh, certain plants that you might be familiar with are your nipa or atap palm, where you get your atap chi, which is eaten ice kacang. Uh, the, fl the flowers are actually very rich in nectar, which can be fermented into uh, palm wine or can be just used as palm sugar. And we also have uh, colorful insects like these cotton stainer bugs, which are parasites of this sea hibiscus tree. And of course, lots of animals. So we have uh, mangrove jellyfish, uh, smooth coated otters, which uh, nowadays we associate with being in our urban environment. Their natural habitat is actually inside mangrove forest. Uh, we also have a variety of reptiles like this uh, shopit viper, uh, the saltwater crocodile, which is also the largest crocodile in the world. These can be easily seen at Sungai Bolo. Uh, and of course, the dog-faced water snake, which is uh, very commonly seen in our mangroves and it's a hunter of fish. Uh, another animal that eats fish is the buffy fish owl, uh, which you can see here. This one is uh, very resilient. It's a famous uh, individual at Pasir Ris, uh, which has actually lost one eye, but yet he has been able to do very well uh, despite this. So moving on to the rocky shore, uh, mangrove forest, like I said, is found where you have uh, rivers or fresh water. These are places where um, the shoreline is very bare. Uh, it's a very harsh environment. Uh, animals here have to be adapted to hot sun and high temperatures all the time. Uh, and the only source of food is basically going to be the algae that grow on the rocks and shellfish like oysters. So uh, animals here have adaptations to survive these high temperatures. Some of them like this uh, purple climbing crab, they will find little pools of water to hide in when the tide goes out. Uh, others like the jeweled chitin, uh, or the drill snail. These are shellfish which are adapted to uh, retaining water by um, clinging very tightly onto uh, the rock surface so that water can't evaporate. Uh, you have cryptic sea stars which actually hide on the underside of rocks so they're not exposed to the sun at all. Uh, lightning dove snails uh, which are grazers of algae and the ong slug. So this is a sea slug which actually uh, has a primitive kind of lung that enables it to continue breathing even when the water is out. And you can see here it's grazing on algae while leaving behind a trail of slime. Okay, the beach. So this is probably the habitat that most Singaporeans are familiar with, right? We go to East Coast Park, we go to Sentosa, and it looks very bare, like there's not much life there. But actually, uh, it's an important habitat for some animals. Uh, most animals don't live here permanently, uh, and those that do tend to be scavengers. Uh, for animals like the coastal horseshoe crab, the beach is important because this is where they lay their eggs. Uh, amongst the animals that do live here permanently are your ghost crabs. So ghost crabs are mostly scavengers. They eat uh, whatever washes up onto the shore, like dead animals. But they will also eat uh, smaller animals such as uh, baby sea turtles. Uh, the Malayan water monitor is also mainly a scavenger, but here you can see it's actually managed to catch a ghost crab. And like I mentioned uh, in passing, the hawksbill sea turtle actually nests uh, on Singapore's beaches. Uh, in, in fact, the beaches that we have in our southern islands uh, and along East Coast Park are an important nesting ground for this critically endangered species. So these are the hatchlings of the hawksbill sea turtle uh, making their way out to sea. There's also another very cute animal here, uh, the land hermit crab. So these hermit crabs are scavengers that live on the, on the beach. Uh, you can see them clustering together in this coconut, which they probably just finished eating. Okay, now moving on to habitats which are more or less submerged all the time, except at the lowest of tides. Uh, first one is mudflats. So when you look, look at a mudflat, you think like, you know, how can this possibly survive, uh, support any life? Uh, it's waterlogged, it smells, like there's a, there's a very strong pungent smell, but that's actually what we call the fart of life. Uh, it comes from uh, sulfur reducing bacteria, which are making use of uh, sulfur compounds inside the water to produce energy. And this in turn feeds a rich ecosystem of worms and snails, uh, which larger animals like these migratory birds will then come to eat. So our mud flats are actually very important uh, in the global context because birds migrating through Singapore will feed there. 
Uh, and most of the animals here tend to be quite small because if they're too big, you will actually sink through the mud. Uh, so for example, this monitor lizard, a relatively young one, uh, hunting for a crab inside a burrow. Uh, we also have mud skippers, which uh, some people might think are amphibians, but they're actually fish that have adapted to crawl around uh, on land. So mud skippers are able to do this because they can keep water inside their mouth, continue breathing with their gill chamber. And at the same time, they have skin that is permeable to oxygen, so they can breathe through their skin so long as it's wet. Here you have two males which are competing over a female, and they're actually using their fins to signal to each other. Uh, of course, we have the horseshoe crab. Uh, this is the mangrove horseshoe crab, different from the coastal one we saw earlier. Uh, they eat mainly algae and small animals inside the mud. Uh, fiddler crabs, uh, the majority of these are male, the ones with the large claws. And they use these claws to uh, signal to each other or fight each other. Uh, and mainly they do this to protect a piece of territory uh, so that they can then attract the females, which are these smaller ones, uh, as a mate. So the male hermit crabs are actually permanently handicapped because they can't use the large claw to eat. And of course, we have lots of shorebirds, I mentioned earlier, that rely on the mud flats as a rich source of food. So besides mud flats, we also have sand flats. All right. So unlike your mud flat, you can actually walk safely on a sand flat. Uh, and it's similar to a mud flat, it looks like it's very bare, but actually lots of animals are burrowed just under the surface. So for example, sand dollars. Right? Sand dollars are uh, basically relatives of sea urchins that have been flattened uh, into kind of like a pancake shape. And they eat lots of uh, detritus um, that is found inside the sand. You also have uh, predatory animals like your ball moon snail. So these are actually snails which are burrowed just under the surface of the sand. And then they hunt out smaller shellfish like these button snails. And in fact, if you go to a sand flat, you will see sometimes as the moon snail uh, crawls around, the button snails will start panicking and jumping away. Uh, also more migratory birds like plovers. Uh, these will hunt for worms uh, inside your sand flat. And also the fixed snail, which is another predatory snail, similar to your ball moon snail. You can see there's a button snail here, which uh, it seems to have kind of missed. Seagrass meadows. Okay, so uh, contrary to what many people think, seagrasses are not seaweeds. They are actually true plants. There are only 12 species found in Singapore. Um, and these are plants that can bear flowers and fruits. Uh, we can still find this habitat in places like Changi, uh, Czech Java and Pulau Ubin, but even at East Coast Park, in fact. And they are important nursery for many young fish and a habitat for lots of animals, such as these knobbly sea stars. Uh, this is taken on Sirene Reef, which as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the site of one of our largest seagrass meadows. So the areas in uh, dotted blue are where you can generally find seagrass, and the red areas circled are where our most important seagrass meadows are found. So unlike your mangrove or coral reef, you can generally find them both north and south of Singapore. Okay, so uh, sea grasses um, come in many different shapes and sizes, depending on their species. You have fern sea grass, uh, needle sea grass, and spoon sea grass, all growing here side by side. Uh, ribbon sea grass over here. And we also have uh, tape sea grass, which can grow up to uh, a meter long. And it gets so long that you basically can't see anything underneath it. So tape sea grass is uh, quite interesting because um, these are the flowers. Uh, the female flowers are the longish ones. Oh, sorry. But the tiny little bits that look like styrofoam here are actually the male flowers. So during low tide, the female flowers will actually unzip and then float on the surface of the water. And then the male flowers will be released from the male plant and float over to the female flower and pollinate it. So the entire flower is the pollinating agent. And inside your seagrass meadows, you find a very rich uh, variety of species. You get uh, cuttlefish, uh, baler snails. So these snails are, can grow to the size of a coconut, in fact, and they are also aggressive predators. You can see the siphon uh, sticking out as it hunts for other snails to eat. Uh, colorful sea slugs like this uh, phyllodesmium. Uh, octopuses, which are actually very common in Singapore, and they are also uh, amongst the most intelligent of all invertebrates. Uh, the Pentasrestor sea star, uh, which I said earlier is found only in the Indian Ocean, uh, and we are uh, the easternmost location that it can be found. 
Uh, this is a sea apple sea cucumber, which is very different from the sea cucumbers that we normally eat. Uh, as you can kind of guess from the bright colors, it's actually highly toxic. So bright colors usually serve as a warning sign in the animal kingdom. And in fact, if you uh, put this uh, sea cucumber in, say, your own aquarium, it would probably cause uh, everything else inside to die. So larger animals also rely on the seagrass meadow for food. Uh, you, for example, the great built heron, even wild boar. So wild boar, because they're omnivores um, and they eat basically anything they can fit in their mouth, they will actually come out onto the seagrass meadow and uh, eat all sorts of uh, crustaceans uh, and snails. Another very charismatic animal that relies on seagrasses is the dugong. So although it's very, very hard uh, to actually see a dugong in Singapore because they come up for just a few seconds to breathe, uh, we know that they're still around because we can see the signs that they've been around. So dugong feeding trails are these very long, uh, sorry, bare trails in the seagrass meadow, which we continue to see regularly at places like Chek Jawa or Siren Reef, which tells us that they are still around and still coming to eat the seagrasses here. They probably don't live permanently in Singapore, uh, but they visit from time to time from Malaysia. Now moving out uh, towards the open sea, we look at uh, habitats that are almost never uh, uh, exposed to the air. So first one would be uh, our coral reefs. So yes, we have coral reefs in Singapore uh, and they are concentrated uh, basically all along our southern coast where the salinity is much higher. Uh, the purple lines are where you can generally find corals. And uh, we are kind, you can kind of split coral reef habitat into coral rubble and the true coral reef. So what is coral rubble? So corals are animals uh, that produce uh, hard exoskeletons of uh, limestone. And when they die, they leave this behind, building up the coral reef over time. Eventually, waves will break parts of this reef into smaller and smaller pieces and leave behind a habitat uh, that is uh, full of like broken piece of, pieces of coral. Uh, it tends to be dominated by seaweeds, as you can see here, the brown ones are seaweed, uh, but you will actually have some corals growing here as well. So this is uh, Pulau Jong, where you can see uh, coral rubble uh, basically dominates the reef flat, uh, and then you have some rocky shore and then coastal forest behind. And in your coral rubble, lots of animals uh, thrive here because there's a lot of places to hide, right? So. For example, the blue dragon nudibranch. Uh, this is a, a very, very uh, you know, beautiful sea slug that is actually quite common uh, in Singapore. Uh, they eat um, mostly, uh, I think, algae and some uh, hydroids. We also have octopuses. So octopuses really love the coral rubble because they can squeeze into all the little tiny cracks uh, in this habitat. An octopus uh, has only one body part that's hard, which is the beak or the mouth. And so long as that tiny mouth can fit inside uh, a crack or a crevice, uh, the whole body is able to squeeze in. And as you can see here, they can be very colorful. They can change color. Uh, this one turned like bright green and purple as a form of warning. Um, this one is a bit more subdued, but they can actually turn to brown color as well to blend in with their habitat. You will also have uh, stingrays, which will uh, hunt the coral rubble for animals, such as crabs. Uh, and they can actually bury themselves under the sand to hide. And of course, we have giant clams uh, like this one, which are endangered in Singapore, uh, but you can still find them in the Southern Islands if you're lucky. Uh, another interesting feature of animals in this habitat is that a lot of them have like snake-like bodies or worm-like bodies, uh, like this uh, synapid sea cucumber. So this enables them again to squeeze into all the different cracks and crevices that you can find in this habitat. Uh, you also have uh, the yellow lip sea crate, which is a very, very venomous sea snake, but it's actually um, not threatening to humans because uh, they basically won't bite you unless you provoke them. Uh, they usually spend uh, the time hunting the coral rubble for fish. And there's also this uh, carpet eel blenny. Uh, again, the, the long uh, snake-like shape allows it to uh, hunt out smaller fish uh, that are hiding inside all the different crevices. Uh, some animals that live here are very dangerous as well, such as the textile cone snail. Uh, so cone snails are snails which are actually able to hunt fish. And the reason that they can do that, even though they are very slow moving animals, is that they have a harpoon tipped with a very, very potent uh, neurotoxin that can kill the fish within seconds. So uh, this is one good reason why you shouldn't be picking up uh, seashells when you're on the seashore, because 
if you don't know what you're picking up, you might actually be picking up a dangerous kind of snail like the cone snail. So it's better not to uh, disturb the animals that you see in our intertidal shores. Uh, we also have this uh, very brightly colored burrowing giant clam. Uh, as you can see, the entire body has been uh, burrowed into the rock, which basically makes it impossible for a predator to get it out. So moving on to uh, the actual coral reef, uh, we have both intertidal and uh, subtidal coral reefs. This is taken at uh, Kusu Island, and you can see in the distance uh, is our CBD. And this is taken uh, scuba diving in uh, one of our southern islands. Uh, and this is basically what the reefscape looks like. It's a very uh, complex 3D environment uh, where there's lots of space for fishes to hide, uh, hunt, like hide and seek between predators and prey. And although Singapore's uh, waters tend to be murkier, um, it continues to host a lot of rich marine life. So all these are animals that uh, you can find in scuba diving in our coral reefs. We have uh, big sea urchins, uh, puffer fish. Uh, these puffer fish are actually very big. They can get up to um, 30 to 40 centimeters. Uh, they're not as toxic as the ones um, that people eat in Japan for sashimi, uh, but you still probably shouldn't eat them. Um, yeah. So we also have feather stars. Uh, which are relatives of your sea star, but they use their feathery arms to um, catch tiny particles of food that are floating in the water. And of course, your ever famous uh, Nemo or clown anemone fish, uh, which have a symbiotic relationship with anemones. Uh, here, if you look hard enough, that's actually a cuttlefish uh, that has uh, changed not just its color, but the texture of its body so that it can blend in with uh, its surrounding environment. And again, uh, this trend of uh, brightly colored animals, you have uh, this nudibranch or sea slug, uh, which has these bright colors probably to indicate that it either tastes bad or is poisonous. So the open sea now, uh, this is, uh, I guess you could say the largest habitat that you'll find in Singapore. It's all around us. Uh, and on the surface, it looks like there's nothing much here, right? It's just uh, bare open water. Um, but lots of animals continue to live in the open sea, uh, such as uh, cetaceans and pelagic birds. And some of these you can still see in Singapore. So we have, in fact do have dolphins, right? This is the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin, uh, commonly known as the pink dolphin because uh, the older adults sometimes have a pinkish color to their skin. Uh, you can see this is actually the baby uh, over here. Uh, this is probably the mother. Uh, this photo was taken um, at St. John's Island, where there's a resident family of dolphins that has to hang out around there. We also have uh, seabirds like this tern, uh, very common uh, amongst our islands. Uh, so terns will actually hover above the water, looking out for a fish, and then when they spot one, they'll do a dive in order to catch the fish, uh, a lot like kingfisher. So certain birds, uh, seabirds, are rare visitors to Singapore. So for example, the Christmas Island frigate bird and the brown booby, these are not resident here, um, but they are usually found in nearby Indonesia. Every now and then, uh, one of them will happen to blow into Singapore uh, while it's looking for food. And then there'll be a mad rush as uh, birders will actually uh, go out to look for these uh, rare animals. And of course, we have our own native uh, predatory seabirds like the white-bellied sea eagle. This is probably the most common raptor uh, in Singapore. Uh, you, I'm sure you have seen them uh, during your visits to the shore. This is actually a juvenile, uh, as you can tell from how the, the undersides of the wings are not quite completely white. Okay, so now moving on to um, the most mysterious of all our marine habitats, which is the seafloor. So it's the least well-defined habitat because, um, well, the seafloor basically can mean anything from zero meters depth all the way down to 200 meters uh, in our waters. We actually have a, an area called the Singapore Deeps, this red area here, that goes all the way down to 200 meters. Uh, and the, the substrate of the seafloor could vary, it could be mud, it could be sand. And usually the only way we can survey this place is to do things like uh, uh, a trawl beam, where we basically drag a net uh, over the surface of the seabed. And we see what we can get. So, uh, what do you think you'll find at the bottom of the sea? Uh, actually quite a lot. So for example, you have uh, the Neptune's cut sponge. So this is a species of sponge which was thought to be extinct in Singapore 
or even in fact globally for more than 100 years before it was rediscovered about 10 years ago. Uh, we have basket stars. So you can see this video um, was actually going around Facebook uh, quite a number of years ago. It looks like a very alien creature. Uh, it's actually a relative of uh, your starfish, just that uh, every arm subdivides into many branching arms. And we used to think it was very rare in Singapore, but actually uh, when we survey the, the 50 meters and below seabed, uh, these are very, very common. Sea fans. So this is taken uh, at a very low tide um, at what you could kind of call like a zero meter seabed. But sea fans are actually quite commonly found uh, throughout our seabed uh, in our waters at different depths. Uh, we also surprisingly get animals that we find normally find the intertidal anyway. So like your bristle worms, your elbow crab, and these sea stars. These sea stars were actually found uh, at depths of like, you know, 50 to 100 meters. And surprisingly, these are actually the, many of these are the exact same species we see at places like Changi Beach, all right? Which means that they actually have, are very, very adaptable. They can move between uh, a huge variety of depths. Okay, so having gone through like all our different shores, uh, how does M Parks actually protect this uh, marine biodiversity that we have? So the first one is that we conserve key habitats. We can see all these are basically um, nature reserves and parks, which uh, M Parks has set aside in order to uh, allow us to continue to enjoy these coastal habitats. Uh, we also have um, uh, fishing allowed only in specific areas in these places so that um, we wouldn't have uh, overfishing and people can continue to enjoy uh, uh, fishing into future generations. Over here, we have uh, Singapore's very first marine park at Sisters Island. On top of that, we also do habitat enhancement, restoration and species recovery. So this photo here is from a project that happened uh, about one and a half years ago, where NPARKs together with JTC lowered artificial reefs into Sisters Island Marine Park, which will provide habitat for corals and fish. Uh, this is the Neptune's cut sponge, which uh, has been relocated into Sisters Island for its own protection. And of course, we have a turtle hatchery on Sisters Island as well. Uh, habitat uh, restoration here, this is uh, Pulau Tekong. Uh, it was a project done by MPARKs uh, more than 10 years ago in order to restore the mangroves there against uh, erosion. On top of that, MPARKs does lots of research. So some of this research is done uh, in collaboration with uh, scientists such as at NUS. So this was from the Mega Marine Survey that lasted five years and started in 2010. We also do our own surveys of our shores to see where rare plants and animals can be found so that we know uh, which places are important to protect. Uh, this is a photo of coral spawning. So every year, um, corals will actually spawn around April. Uh, this is when they reproduce and they release eggs and sperm all together. And we actually do modeling to see um, which places are most important for, or rather most likely that coral larvae will settle so that we know where we need to protect. Uh, at the same time, our corals do continue to face threats like coral bleaching. Uh, and we actually have a team of uh, uh, staff that will work together with our citizen scientists in order to go and monitor these places. Of course, we also have outreach. So talks like what uh, we're doing today are a very important part of MPARC's work. Uh, it's important that uh, people in Singapore know about our marine life so that they can then grow to love it and through loving it, uh, decide they want to protect it. So we do things like outreach events, uh, citizen science programs, guided walks. And uh, in fact, we welcome lots of volunteers as part of our outreach efforts. So what can you do to help protect our shores? Well, first of all, actually go and visit them. So uh, there are places where you can use boardwalks such as Sungai Bulo or Chek Jawa. Um, so you like no need to get dirty. You can observe wildlife from the boardwalk. You can also join intertidal walks, uh, some conducted by MPARCs, others conducted by um, private operators. Uh, and you can actually scuba dive in our waters as well. So don't go alone, uh, bring your friends and your family, uh, share the photos that you take online so that more people will know about this, All right? Uh, also take care that you don't uh, end up having too large of an impact on the environment. For example, if you go on an intertidal walk, go in small groups and preferably go with uh, an experienced guide so that uh, you don't end up trampling all over the place. Uh, you can also volunteer. So MPARCs have lots of uh, opportunities that uh, involve the coastal and marine environment. 
you can visit uh, our community in nature webpage, uh, where you have links to join uh, these various citizen science programs. And there are also uh, other blue groups which uh, work together with MPARTS in order to uh, help gather data or to conserve our marine habitats, such as Team Seagrass, uh, Nature Society, or Blue Water Volunteers. Uh, another important thing, don't litter. So one of the biggest threats that our shores face uh, is plastic trash. And actually, the majority of this trash doesn't come from the sea. It comes from the land. So if you litter on land uh, and a storm comes along, it will wash your litter into our waterways and the waves will then wash the litter back onto the shore. So uh, instead of littering, what you can do is you help in coastal cleanups, like over here. Um, volunteer groups, uh, some organized by MPARTS, uh, but others organized by uh, NGOs, regularly will do cleanups on our shores in order to uh, reduce the load of trash. And finally, uh, practice sustainable fishing. So fishing is a very popular hobby in Singapore, uh, but we will encourage you to fish only in designated areas uh, and using only hook and line. So this is to ensure that uh, you will not overfish uh, our waters and future generations can continue to enjoy uh, this uh, hobby. So practice catch and release. Uh, you don't have to eat every fish that you catch. Uh, and also be very careful to avoid rocky areas where you may lose your lines. So losing a fishing line obviously is a pain for fishermen. But it's also a major pain for marine life because when they get left behind, they will tangle up things like crabs and fish, which will then die when they're stuck inside the fishing line. Okay, so um, to kind of round up uh, to this talk, um, we can go back to the mentee link um, where I have one final question for you guys. Okay, so what was the most interesting thing you learned today? Oh, okay, there are dugongs in Singapore, yeah. Yeah, when I found out for the first time, I was very mind blown as well, that we shouldn't pick up seashells. So uh, the reason we don't pick up seashells, partly for our own safety, but a lot of it is also to um, avoid uh, too much impact on the environment, because seashells are actually important habitats for uh, things like hermit crabs. Oh, dolphins in Singapore, coral reefs. blue dragon. Yeah, that's actually my favorite uh, marine animal in Singapore. Biodiversity within our shores. Should not fish too much. <laughs> so, well, actually, um, I'd say that Go ahead and fish as much as you want to, but if you practice catch and release, uh, you don't bring the fish back home, and you give the chance, uh, the fish a chance to uh, get larger, continue to reproduce, um, your impact on the fish population is going to be a lot lower. Don't eat everything you catch, yeah. Visit some of the islands. 200 meters depth. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, I'm really glad that um, you guys learned a lot of things today. Um, so thank you all for listening. Uh, I'll hand over the time back to Leslie now. All right, thank you, Jonathan, for taking us through a whole range of habitats from our shoreline to the depths of the sea. So we will now proceed with our Q&A. Thank you to all those who submitted their questions. Okay, so the first question that we have is, can all of these animals really be found in Singapore? Uh, yeah, they can all be found in Singapore. So um, all the photos that you saw earlier, except for the ones which uh, I captioned as being taken from somewhere else, they were all, uh, sorry, by someone else, they were all taken by myself. And even of the ones not taken by me, they were all taken in Singapore, with the exception of the dugong photo. So, uh, yeah, we have dugongs in Singapore. They're hard to spot because our waters are very murky. 
Um, so that's why I have to use a photo from somewhere else. But yes, they can all be found in Singapore. Um, some are much easier to find than others. Uh, and if you want to find out more about uh, how you can try spotting these animals, um, yeah, I wouldn't have enough time to cover that in the talk, but you can find a lot of this information uh, on the internet. All right, so yep, all the animals that Jonathan highlighted today can be found right here in Singapore. So our next question is, what is the best time to visit coastal habitats in order to see these creatures? Okay, so that really depends on um, which habitat you're talking about, right? So every habitat is different. Um, for example, let's say you want to go to mangrove forest. Uh, you can go at high tide or low tide and you'll see very different things. Um, at high tide, you see the fishes swimming about in the water. Uh, at low tide, you might see, you'll see the crabs and the mud skippers. Maybe the snakes come out. Um, and so I'd say the best you should do is to look at uh, the tide table. Um, so, okay, sorry, let me rephrase that. Uh, the best thing you can do is look at the tides and then decide uh, when you want to go. So NEA does publish um, for every day uh, um, the maximum high tide mark and low tide mark and at what time that happens as well. Uh, so it's not as detailed as uh, MPA's tide table, but it's a good enough gauge. You look at that and then you decide, oh, if let's say I want to visit the mangrove forest at high tide, what time should I go? Um, if I want to go to the seagrass meadow, uh, it has to be at low tide. Um, and then you, you can look at the timing that um, that NEA has published and then you decide what time you want to go. There is no uh, single best time. It basically depends on the tide of the day. Um, for certain habitats like uh, coral reef, for example, uh, to visit, you have to go and, well, if you wanted to visit the subtidal reef, you have to dive. Uh, what you can probably do is get in touch with a dive operator in Singapore and they will have a very good idea of um, which windows are diveable. Yeah. Okay, I hope that answers the question. So in summary, whether at different times in the day, at different tide levels, there are different types of animals, different types of habitats which you can see. Next question, how can I visit some of these shores? Okay, how you can visit? Um, again, well, it, given how varied our shores are, there are different ways of getting to different places. Uh, I'll try and kind of group it by habitat, right? So for coastal forest, um, quite easy. You just need to visit one of the parks um, that has coastal forests like Coney Island, uh, Labrador Nature Reserve, for example. Uh, for mangroves, um, there are lots of boardwalks which uh, M Parks has built at different parks like Pasir Ris, um, Sungai Buloh, uh, Chek Jawa and Pulau Ubin. Uh, so again, relatively easy to visit. Um, for the intertidal areas, uh, certain places like um, Changi Beach and East Coast Park. So that's probably the easiest to access. Uh, you can actually just go there um, to certain stretches. For example, uh, at Changi Beach, if you go to uh, the area around Kapak 1 and Kapak 7, uh, at low tide, you see the seagrass meadow. Uh, at East Coast Park, if you go to the area in front of um, the NSRCC, uh, there's a very nice seagrass meadow there as well. Um, for places like coral reefs, you would have to go to the southern islands. Uh, and there are boats that you can uh, charter from uh, Marina South Pier. Uh, it's not very expensive. Um, it's something like uh, a bit less than $200 for a 12-seater boat two-way. Uh, and you can basically choose what time you want to go. You time it with the right tide and you can see the coral reefs that are exposed during low tide. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, uh, if you want to go scuba diving, there are a number of scuba diving operators in Singapore that you can inquire about. Yeah. Uh, oh, right. Another thing to add, um, if you're visiting the intertidal for the first time, um, it's probably best that you go with um, a guide. So there are a number of, um, I think, nature guides, uh, like commercial nature guides in Singapore, which do intertidal walks. Uh, and of course, as well, uh, free uh, guided walks that are done by NGOs. So if you can go with one of these groups, um, to get uh, your, your very first experience there, it will be a lot safer. And you also have a better idea of, you know, what is safe to do, um, how you can avoid having a uh, high impact on the environment when you visit the shores. Okay, so I think there are a variety of habitat types, both on the mainland and offshore islands. So whenever you want to visit, do uh, be sure to 
do the necessary preparation and check the relevant advisories before visiting. And you can refer to the NPARC's website for information about these. Finally, what is the most surprising thing about these habitats that you have found during your work with NBC? Well, surprising, I think, is probably the fact that, you know, we look at Singapore as a city-state, um, like such a heavy human impact on our waters, but somehow marine life is able to find a way. Uh, even in places that, you know, have uh, undergone such heavy uh, human modification, given enough time, marine life comes back. Uh, like some of the places that um, I mentioned earlier as having a lot of marine life, like Kusu Island, uh, uh, East Coast Park, these were actually places which uh, had uh, land reclamation done in the past. But then uh, in the past 20 or 30 years, marine life has come back, right? You have rich seagrass meadows there, uh, coral has come back, and even very like artificial environments like uh, marinas. So if you go to um, Keppel Marina or Setosa Cove, you will see lots of uh, marine life growing on the pontoons that are inside the marinas, uh, and it supports a rich variety of life. Like we even have reports of uh, sea turtles uh, swimming about in our marinas as they feed on the sponges that are growing there. Yeah. So yeah, marine life is just really, really resilient in Singapore. Okay, so even in a highly urbanized city, we are very fortunate that nature can still thrive. That's it, we should still work hard to conserve what we have, which is actually a nice segue into something I'd like to mention. So Jonathan briefly talked about some strategies to conserve and restore habitats, scientific research, and community outreach. And all of these are part of our Nature Conservation Master Plan, which details our systematic approach to conserving our rich biodiversity and transforming Singapore into a city in nature. So if you're interested, for more information, you can watch our very first NPARC Spotlight Talk on YouTube. There's a segment in which our group director, Lim Liang Jim, outlines this plan. You can also check out the links being shared in the Zoom chat. All of our previous talks are also on our YouTube channel, so do check them out in your own time. From creatures that lurk in the night to turtles that nest on our shores intertidal treasures and wonders of our rainforests. I'd like to say a big thank you to Jonathan for being with us today, as well as our audience in both Zoom and YouTube. We hope you'll also join us for our upcoming talks. Registration for July's Zoom sessions has closed, but we have more coming up in August. We have a variety of interesting topics lined up, whether you are a nature lover or new to learning about biodiversity. So stay tuned for those. And don't forget that you can stream all of our talks live on the NPARC's SG YouTube channel. If you have any feedback about today's session, we'd like to hear it. So please scan the QR code on the left. If you want to find out about upcoming talks, you can scan the QR code on the right or look out for updates on NPARC's social media channels. The links for all these are also being shared in the chat. And with that, we have come to the end of today's session. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Have a great weekend. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>